thank you all for being here. Uh, this is the uh, second semester of the Classics and Archaeology Learning Community Series. And this year, the focus was for us to introduce all our faculty, a number of them, the most, uh, uh, the, the most stable uh, collaborators across campus are the Art History Department. And so it is a, a great joy to introduce today Dr. Amanda Herring. I know a number of our students are eagerly trying to get into her courses. So we have some good news for you guys. She's going to be holding a couple of seats uh, in her courses for you uh, in the fall. So you can go and talk to her at the end. I want to also acknowledge uh, Kirsten Noreen from the Art History. So it's wonderful when we have uh, faculty from across campus. And our next speaker, who is Mark Anderson from History. So um, it's good to see so many, as well, of course, as my uh, regular, usual suspects, the Classics and Archaeology faculty. So this, this has been a, a busy week for us, right? So on Tuesday, we welcomed the Greek Consul General, and there were uh, as many as 100 students from three different classes, and that was wonderful. Uh, today, uh, we will be in, I will be introducing uh, Amanda Herring, but I wanted to, uh, for those of us who are um, holding a nice glass, I wanted us to raise this glass and wish happy birthday to Dr. Heidi Pessler. Oh, happy birthday. And now you will know that my birthday is tomorrow. So <laughs> hey, we're celebrating double birthday today, okay? So it's always good to celebrate with all of you because this is our, our family, right? So our students and our faculty. And as part of this extended family, as I said, is Amanda Herring. So let me properly introduce her to you today. Amanda Herring received her BA in Art History and Classical and Archaeology from Dartmouth College and her MA PhD in Art History from UCLA. At LMU, she teaches courses on the art and architecture of the ancient world. With a specialization in Hellenistic Greece, her research explores how architecture and sculpture were used as expression of cultural and ideological identities in a period of rapid social and political change. In particular, she has examined the Temple of Hecate at Lagina, the Temple of Artemis at Magnesia on the Meander, and the statue, the Barberini Fon. Her research also examines the reception of the classical past in the modern world, and recent publications have focused on the history of archaeology in the 19th century Ottoman Empire. Her current research project examines the superhero Wonder Woman and the manner in which her comics reinterpret and depict Greek myths, particularly their transformation of Amazons from antagonists to heroes. Her work has been published by the Journal of History of Sexuality, History of Photography, and Cochin Institute of Archaeology Press, and she's presented her work at various venues, including the annual conferences at the Archaeological Institute of America and the College Art Association. Today, she will be talking to us about Heroes on the Move, Reimagining Greek Heroes in the Hellenistic World. So welcome, Amanda. Thank you, Katerina, and thank you to all of you for coming uh, to hear me talk tonight about one of my current research projects. Uh, as Katerina mentioned, I have two feet, one in the ancient world and one in the modern. And I've been looking at the theme of heroes for a while, a couple of different projects, uh, both in the ancient world and in the modern. So this is one of my current research projects on Hellenistic to heroes. Uh, I started looking at this, one, because I look at the Hellenistic period, that's period I focus on. But two, because I teach this class, I'm teaching it this semester called From Greece to Gotham. And we look at heroes in the ancient world and we look at them in the modern. And I realized as I was going through this that for the most part I focus on how our Greek heroes are depicted in the archaic, in the classical periods, about 600 down to 300, 350, and that my beloved Hellenistic period is underrepresented. And so I started thinking about how heroes fit into some of these themes I've looked at for a long time of identity and cultural imperialism in the Hellenistic period. And so I started looking at, okay, what happens to Heracles and uh, Bellerophon and some of these others in the Hellenistic period? And I found this incredibly rich corpus of artworks uh, that I am still 
putting together and finding. Uh, nobody's really looked at these as a corpus before, so this is what I'm, I'm doing. Some of the heroes have been studied pretty significantly. Telephus and Pergamon, well, um, it's probably the best example. There's a few others. But what I'm really interested in is our Greek heroes. And in, today I'm going to talk about Heracles, Bellerophon, and Ariadne, and how they are reimagined in this new world of, of empires across this, these very large territories. And particularly, my argument is that heroes are a fundamental part of how we can understand the Hellenistic world. They're a great fruitful avenue of inquiry for this, that they are representative of the both intensely interconnected, yet also intensely local nature of the Hellenistic period. And that in this period, we see heroes transformed from kind of tools of cultural imperialism of Alexander and his successors to kind of these loci of local identity formation. So let me show you some of the examples. Uh, we'll focus, as I said, Heracles, then we'll go to Bellerophon, and then we'll look at Ariadne. Uh, when I am looking at the Hellenistic world, I am defining it pretty broadly. Uh, all the way from over here in Greece, North uh, Africa, Egypt, Libya, and across from Anatolia through the Middle East into what is now modern Afghanistan. And I'm going to show you things that were found uh, from all the way from Anatolia. Up, we're going to take a little detour up to Kazakhstan and then all the way over here into Bactria. So it's, it's a pretty broad range of areas. And these areas are, some of the artworks are going to have been made and used by people who identify as Greek, and others were probably made and used by people who didn't identify as Greek. And I, I'm going to, for our purposes, kind of put them in one single basket. So here's our map, Hellenistic world about 188, and these are the various kingdoms we have established in the Hellenistic period. So Alexander comes through with his conquests end of the fourth century. Uh, and the Hellenistic period is the period that follows this for the next few hundred years after Alexander's death and the establishment of these large kingdoms uh, by Greek-speaking kings. And we have a few major areas of kingdoms. There's the Ptolemies here in Egypt. Uh, we have the Seleucids in the Middle East. Uh, we have various kingdoms that established here in Greece and in Anatolia, uh, Pergamon, the kingdom of Lysimachus, we have Antipater over here in Greece at various times. As part of the conquest and then for these kings, the maintenance of empire, cultural imperialism and the spreading of Greek language, mythology, religion, culture is a key part of what they're doing. You know, this is the reason we call it the Hellenistic period, the spread of Hellenism. Yet, this is not simply a passive population, and this is a population of millions of people who are speaking various languages, practicing various religions, uh, various cultural belief systems. So it's not simply this passive population, and it's not a monolithic population, it's a very diverse population. And it's not just simply, okay, now we're all Greek. <laughs> Instead, we have this negotiation happening over and over again on a local level between the Greek that is being spread forcefully and the non-Greek. And heroes are part of this. And they are part of that negotiation and the adoption of things that are Greek and transforming them and hybridizing them into something new. And so when I'm showing you these different heroes, they're drawing upon the established iconography and myth for all of these different figures, yet giving them new meanings new artistic styles, and new ways of thinking of them. Um, and so that trying to get into that very layered identity of these different groups of people during the period. And I think heroes are a perfect way of understanding that. Uh, the use of heroes and the mythical past become an important way of establishing identity in the Hellenistic period. Establishing who you are descended from. Uh, via different heroes, who you have connections with, like, oh, hey, our local hero was born in Nemea or Tegia or wherever. He's, we have a connection to us, we're sister cities, or where they fit in the world.
world in terms of, okay, we're both Anatolian and Greek, or we are Greco-Bactrian, and heroes play a role in, in helping figure that out. So let's look at some examples. Uh, we'll start with Heracles, and uh, I'm going to show you a couple of Heracleses from um, Anatolia, and then we'll move across. I'll show you a Heracles uh, from Persia, and then a few from So Heracles, and if you guys have studied Greek art or myth in any way, shape, or form, you've probably seen Heracles, you've at least seen the Disney movie, uh, is the most popular Greek hero. He shows up everywhere. Um, I was putting together a, a lecture today and, and looking at the statistic that if you look at archaic Greek pottery, half of the surviving pottery shows Heracles. Like, he's incredibly popular. Uh, we frequently call him the ultimate Pan-Hellenic hero because he is worshipped, he is depicted across Greece. And here's just a couple of examples. These are local, these are from the Getty. Uh, and it's Heracles' big labors here, the Minian lion. And then here, this little statuette with this standard iconography for Heracles. You can always identify him. His lion skin, his club. He's one of our few heroes that fights with a club. And he's always a little older, nicely bearded, heavily muscled physique and usually some curly hair. I'll try and gesture and use my remote at the same time and I don't remember where I put that. Okay. So, as we go forward in the Hellenistic period, Heracles looks like this still. Uh, but he's no longer just the Panhellenic hero. Uh, he's still establishing Greekness and ties to Greece, but he takes on uh, kind of layered meanings at different spots. So we're going to start with Magnesia here, kind of on the west coast of Asia Minor, Anatolia, uh, very near Ephesus. And Magnesia and Ephesus shared a lot of ties. Uh, notably, the most important goddess in Magnesia was Artemis Lycophrene, Artemis of the White Brow. And this is a close relative of Artemis of Magia, the most important goddess in Ephesus. So, second century, they build a huge temple to Artemis, new one in Magnesia. And this is a really famous temple. It's built by uh, this guy, Hermogenes. Petruvius talks about him. It's unfortunately not in great shape at the moment. There's great archaeological excavations at Magnesia. It's a really fun site to visit. Uh, but I've shown you a digital reconstruction of what it used to look like. Uh, so, a big Ionic temple with an altar out front. Here's what it looks like today. Um, and Magnesia is eventually abandoned because the river changes and the city starts flooding. So this was a photo I took in January a few years ago. It still floods every year, but this is the temple now. Uh, up here in the entablature in our frieze, we have the same subject that wraps around all four sides of the building. Um, this is an Amazon Awaki, a battle of Greeks and Amazons. So Amazons in Greek myth, uh, the non-Greek warrior women. Uh, two homelands are usually assigned to them in Greek myth, the Black Sea region, and then Anatolia, where we are here. And a lot of our Greek heroes fight the Amazons. Heracles fights them, Bellerophon, Achilles, the list goes on. Uh, and so this is one that is particularly a Heraclean Amazon Amaki. It's very repetitive. These are a couple of blocks that are in the Louvre. Standard iconography of the Amazons are not Greek, and so they are women riding horses. Uh, they fight with axes. I mean, they're women going to war, which is inherently not Greek, uh, with the typical iconography of the young, beautiful, heroically nude Greek warrior. Heracles shows up four times, and so we think he was on each side of the building. So each side is a Heraclean Amazon Amagi. He is always identifiable by that same iconography. So here he is, nice nude, bushy beard and hair, the club on one side, uh, here he is on the other. So he's doing the same thing, he's pulling the Amazon off the horse by his hair. Here's his lion skin coming down. This is the remains of his club. So if we go back uh, to the classical and archaic periods, this type of scene shows up a lot, Heracles fighting Amazons. Yet here it takes on a local significance because 
as one of Heracles' labors, he has to get the war belt, uh, frequently translated as girdle from Hippolyta, um, and this battle takes place in the local area. So this is a distinctly local myth. The Amazons take refuge in Ephesus and they found the temple of Ephesus, of, of temple of Artemis in Ephesus. So the closely related temple here. So this becomes a statement of the identity of the Magnesians, their connection to their most important goddess, and their place within local history. They pride themselves on being one of the oldest Greek cities in Anatolia. We have this great inscription found in the upper off. Yet their goddess is distinctly Anatolian looking. Like Artemis of Ephesus, she has all the, the bulbs on her chest. And so we have them here claiming they're part of local, but also Panhellenic Greek identity. Here uh, to Kizikos. This is one of my favorite reliefs. Uh, Kizikos up here on the northern coast here. Uh, there's this relief. It's now in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, and I have never found a better image of it than this one. Uh, this dates very precisely, very exciting, to about 277. So we are 277 to 76. And this is a relief of Heracles defeating a Gaul. And we know this from the inscription below. It gives thanks to Heracles for protecting the city and helping them defeat the Gauls. The Gauls uh, are this Celtic people from in Europe that come in and they first move into Anatolia in 278. So Kizikos is one of the first cities uh, that face a Gallic invasion. And they, as we can tell from our inscription here, successfully defend their city against the Gauls. And our figure here uh, is very clearly not Greek. He's battered, but in the actual one, you can tell he's wearing a non-Greek outfit. Uh, he has this kilt. He has non-Greek weaponry. And Heracles is standing above him with his club and his lion skin over here, getting ready to bring the club down. The reason I love this is frequently the Greeks in earlier periods are attributing their victories to the benevolence or the help of various uh, heroes. Yet here, Heracles is actually fighting the Gauls. We have the combination of myth and history together. And this becomes more prevalent uh, in the Hellenistic period of Heracles as a, an actual figure coming in and stepping in and fighting for them. And Heracles as a symbol of the entire city. It's a connection that seems to be established for a while. Uh, so this is a coin of Kizikos that's uh, minted in about 460 to 400. Uh, it's a small electrum coin. And we have, here's Heracles, a little fish representing uh, Kizikos, which is right on the sea. So Heracles is a symbol of Kizikos is around for a while. And then they're just putting this in this distinctly Hellenistic context. Gauls show up all the, over the place in the Hellenistic period. They become kind of the the enemy of choice in Greek art in Anatolia. One, because we do have a lot of battles with Gauls, but they become shorthand for the non-Greek other. They're a handy enemy to highlight for the Greeks. And so you can see standard iconography still. He's got his club. He's got the nice muscle physique, the nudity, but in a new context. We go east. Uh, and for the next one, I'm going to show you uh, the site of Nemruda, Mount Nemru. This is uh, in the kingdom of Komogeni, which is kind of this borderlands kingdom uh, that's in eastern Anatolia, kind of on the border between what is now kind of Turkey, Armenia, and Syria here. Now, Komogeni as a kingdom uh, breaks off from the Seleucid kingdom. So the Seleucids are our big eastern Greek kingdom ruling most of the Middle East, and uh, they break off from the Seleucids and establish their own kingdom uh, in the second century. So they become independent, and the ruling kings of Komogeni claim descent both from the Seleucid family line and also from the Persian, the Kemenid Persian family line. So when Alexander comes in and conquers this part of the world, he overthrows the Persian Empire ruling families, the Achaemenids. And so 
Antiochus, who I'll show you, and, and his family claim descent that they're ethnically both Greek and Persian. And this shows up in the art of Komogeni, notably uh, the art that is made by Antiochus I, who was king of Komogeni in the first century. And uh, Nimrud Da is probably the most well studied of these complexes. It's this huge sanctuary and tumulus, so funerary complex of Antiochus. Um, this thing is 150 meters in diameter, about 50 meters tall. And then on various sides, there are terraces uh, that have statues of the various Comogenian gods and Antiochus among their number. And so these are colossal. Uh, these are between eight and 10 meters in size. So here they are labeled. <laughs> and so here's Antiochus on the side calling himself a god, and he is among the company of the other gods. And next to him is the personification of um, Komogeni. And then we have the other three are all hybridized, very distinctly Komogenian Greco-Persian figures. So this is basically Zeus and Horamasta, one of the most important Persian gods here. Uh, the next figure is usually identified as a combination of Apollo and Mithras, sometimes Helios and Hermes. And then down here, uh, this is a figure that is Heracles and um, most likely Artigenes, which is a Persian god. So here's a reconstruction, uh, so you can see our figure of Heracles down on the end. He's over eight meters tall in size, he's huge. But he's wearing a distinctly not Greek hat. He's carrying his club. And also on this terrace are a series of reliefs of Antiochus shaking hands with various gods. Uh, they're all blessing him, giving him legitimacy. He is divinely appointed. And this iconography shows up throughout Komogeni. Uh, nearby to Nemerdaz, this relief here, this was found at Arsimea in Theum, so not too far away. Um, here's Heracles shaking hands with Antiochus. And it's striking in that we have Heracles' traditional iconography, that distinctly Greek heroic nudity. He's got his club, he's got his lion skin, and he's shaking hands with Antiochus, who is in a Persian-inspired regalia. Uh, so the very tall hat, uh, this very elaborate costume with the little ball things coming down here is inspired by Persian. And so Heracles, as this Greek god, is giving legitimacy to a Comogenian king to rule over the territory. And that theme of Heracles as a symbol of kingship and legitimacy is probably one of his most common roles in the Hellenistic period. We'll go east. I'll show you a couple more examples. Uh, we'll go to Persia, uh, to Behistun here. Uh, and this is a site in which we have a series of earlier Achaemenid Persian reliefs. And here we have this particular re relief. It's a rock cut relief of Heracles. Uh, there's an inscription that accompanies it. Uh, it's top parts in Greek and the bottom part is in Aramaic. So we have both languages on the relief. And uh, this dates to 148. Another one where we have a nice precise date because of the inscription. And this is a period in which uh, this part of the Iranian plateau is under Seleucid control. They controlled this part of the world for about 200 years, um, from about 312 down to about 139. And so this is 148. And we have, here's Heracles, and he's, he's much larger than life size. He's huge, cut out of the rock, his little cup in his hands, beard, uh, and there's the club and the lion skin behind him. He has a little quiver back here. And the inscription tells us that this was a victorious Heracles, created for the protection of uh, the local territory and its ruler, the satrap. Uh, satrap is a title that comes from the Persian Empire. The Seleucids take this on, kind of a local governor. So the local ruler of this part of the Seleucid Empire 
has commissioned this particular statue in honor. It's very clearly made by not Greek artists, um, local Persian artists. The style of the eyes, the representation of the beard and the body uh, is a local style, artistic style. But drawing upon the Greek Uh, if we go all the way over here to the Greco-Bactrians, here, uh, I'm going to show you some other usage of Heracles. Uh, so the Greco-Bactrian kingdom here uh, is very large territory when it also breaks off from the Seleucids. It breaks off in about the third century. The Seleucids start out as a huge empire and they kind of lose territory over time. And uh, this kingdom is basically modern Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way up into Central Asia. They break off from the Seleucids and uh, they establish their own local Bactrian kingdom. Yet the rulers are adapting many of the symbols of rulership established by the Seleucids, Greek language, uh, some Greek artistic style, and for us, heroes, notably Heracles. So I'll show you a couple of po coins that are minted by Bactrian kings. Uh, this is the first. This is a coin of um, Nicodemus, the first of Bactria. Uh, this is made probably about 230 to 200. And he is here on the front, and this portrait style is repeated again and again across the Hellenistic world. He looks like a Ptolemy, the kings of, of Egypt. He looks like a Seleucid. It's a very Greek style. And then on the back, we have Heracles. Uh, and the inscription here is in Greek. And he has his club and he's sitting on his rock. And for the most part, a lot of these are inscriptions are in Greek on these Greco-Bactrian king coins. Um, eventually, <clears throat> sorry, we start to have, let me take a quick sip here. Uh, both Greek and Brahmi. And our kings are, are identified both as Basileus, the Greek title, and Maharaja. So they're, they're again sitting in this, this two feet and foot in each wall. Uh, here's another one. This is Demetrius I. This is kind of the next king. This is about 200 to 190. And we have Heracles on the back. He's crowning himself. And here's Demetrius on the front. And he's wearing a elephant skin cap. Uh, this is taken directly from the Seleucids. Um, our Seleucid kings represent themselves wearing elephant skin caps as a symbol of their conquest of the East. Uh, this develops from Alexander wearing the lion skin. So all the way back to Alexander, we have kings taking on the symbols of Heracles. Um, so this is a coin uh, minted in about 332. <laughs> with Alexander wearing the lion skin. This is the Alexander sarcophagus inside on in, in Lebanon, and he's wearing that lion skin cap. Um, and so they're taking on these established symbols of the Greek kings. Uh, so here's Seleucus. I'm sorry, this is Alexander. Alexander wears it first, and then the Seleucids do. Um, and this is Ptolemy has it with the, the elephant skin. Here we see on Demetrius as well. Uh, the probably best understood of these Greco-Bactrian sites is I know uh, this is in modern Afghanistan. It was excavated in the 60s and 70s uh, by the French. It's unfortunately one of the sites that has suffered badly in the decades of war in Afghanistan. Uh, most of the finds from Iqnum are now in the Kabul Museum, but the site itself is pretty badly destroyed. Uh, so a lot of what we know about it is from these now 70-year-old archaeological reports. Uh, but there's some references to Heracles found in Iconum. Iconum as a city has Corinthian Greek capitals and a gymnasium uh, side by side with very central, back, central Asian Bactrian kind of themes. So there's an inscription to Heracles in the gym. And then this was a little statue out of him that was found in Iconum. And it's the same Heracles as we see on the coins. 
that same crowning himself, he's got the club. And again, stylistically, this is not Greek. This is not what we see in um, Anatolia. It's not what we see in um, Egypt. And this idea of what we define as Greek, what is Hellenistic changes, and what we say is Greek in Greco-Bactria is very different than what we see in Anatolia. Yet it's still Heracles all the way across. Uh, the other one that is really big is Bellerophon. And the reason I think Heracles and Bellerophon are the two most popular is because they are these wandering heroes. They travel all over the place. So it's really easy to claim them and say, okay, Heracles definitely came to our town or Heracles was in our area or Bellerophon was as well. And Bellerophon in particular is popular in Anatolia, uh, which he spends a lot of his time wandering around. So Bellerophon is originally from Corinth and he's very popular in early Corinthian art. So Bellerophon today probably better remembered for his noble steed Pegasus than he himself. Um, but he goes on a whole series of adventures around the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, you know, he tames Pegasus, kind of. Um, uh, he rides on Pegasus to fight the Chimera. Uh, he goes and becomes the king of Lycia. He fights Amazons. He travels all over. And because he is from Corinth, the Corinthians in the early period love him. He's all over the place in Corinthian art. And then he kind of dies out in popularity. Bellerophon is really not popular in uh, later archaic and classical art. And then in the Hellenistic period, he takes off again. So just kind of an example. Here's one from Rhodes. This is a mosaic um, from the first half of the third century. It's a pebble mosaic. And this becomes our standard iconography of Bellerophon on the back of Pegasus getting ready to spear the chimera down here. As I mentioned, he's particularly popular in Anatolia because he was a king of Lycia and he travels all over. And this association with Lycia starts very early. Uh, we have some 5th century representations of him. So here's Anatolia, here's Lycia, and we're going to go to Plos here. Um, this is 5th century. Uh, this is a whole series of rock cut tombs in the walls in um, Plos, and one of them inside here is a relief of Bellerophon and Pegasus. And so this area in the period. Um, is not entirely Hellenized. Uh, it's come under some Greek control. It's not un uh, Greek imperialism culturally. We're not under Greek political control yet. Yet, Bellerophon is already very popular. And they claim him as a local hero. In the Hellenistic period, this extends out to neighboring Caria. And um, Caria, like Lycia, is, is Hellenized later. We have some early Greek colonies there, but we have a maintenance of local Anatolian language, religious cult customs into the Hellenistic period. And in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, Bellerophon now becomes claimed as a distinctly Carian hero, not just a Lycian hero. So uh, at Helicarnassus here, modern Bodrum, uh, was found uh, this inscription here that's known as the Pride of Helicarnassus or the Salamachus inscription. Uh, this was on a fountain, and it's a poem, and it's basically tell us about why Polycarnassus is so awesome. And the way they establish this is all of these great mythological figures and events took place here in Polycarnassus. So they claim Zeus was born here, um, they claim Ariadne, and they claim Bellerophon. Um, there's a line in the poem. Where is it? Uh, let's see. It's a very Uh, and Pallas, Athena, brought the tamer of Pegasus moving in the sky to be a noble settler after the time when she trod in the tracks of Bellerophon and fixed the boundaries of the land of Hadassah, referring to Polycarnassus here. And so it's claimed here as this founder of Polycarnassus, and then Aphrodisius also claims him as a founder. Uh, so Aphrodisius, there's a small Anatolian town here for quite a while. And then in the Hellenistic period, uh, a new Greek city is established on the site of the 
um, Cari in town, and it becomes a huge city, a very popular, important city in the Roman period. And images of Bellerophon show up across Aphrodisias. Uh, he is claimed as a founder in inscriptions, and then I'll show you two of the images of him. Uh, this is the first, this is from the Sebastian. Uh, this was a building to the cult of the Julian Julio-Claudian family, so this is imperial cult, and so this dates to about 20 to 60. Um, we have images of important local gods and heroes, and the Julio-Claudians, Augustus and Claudius, and all of them show up. And so here's Bellerophon and Pegasus, and he is inserted there in this, this corpus of heroes as the founder of the city. Here's another one. This is from the Civil Basilica. And it's the same iconography again and again. We don't see him fighting uh, the chimera, we see him with Pegasus. And so they're not emphasizing like, look at this heroic deed, he killed a monster. Instead they're saying, hey, he came here and he founded our city. Uh, and it works because in most versions of the myth, Bellerophon tries to ride Pegasus up to the heavens. He wants to become a god. And Pegasus, realizing the folly of his way, kicks him off and he falls to the ground and he spends the rest of his life wandering Anatolia, hated by gods and men. And so you can say in this period he goes and find, founds all kinds of cities. My favorite of all of these um, is from what is now modern Kazakhstan, found in Voldarka, which is up here. And this is way beyond my normal part of the world. Um, and a lot of this is, is published in Kazakh, so it took me quite a while to figure out even where Voltarka was, uh, was a series of graves that were found here. And they were graves of local uh, nomadic equestrian tribes that were buried in the area. And found in one of these graves of a warrior were these uh, set of phalera. They're round, made out of bronze, uh, and these were usually used as decoration for horses or warriors and parades. In this case, they're probably horse equipment. And they were found with these two Valera that represent Pegasus and Bellerophon fighting the Chimera. They were made in Bactria. So we have, and I'll go back to this, this map here. This is too small here, we'll go back a little bit forward. Um, I forgot my big map, but we're here. Let's go all the way over here to Afghanistan here. So they were made in Afghanistan. They made their way to Kazakhstan and they represent a Greek hero. I mean, this, this is not representative of this interconnected nature of the Hellenistic world. They don't know what it is. And it's Greek here, but again, it's not Greek style. It's this kind of Bactrian style. And these questions of why would a Kazakhstani, a Kazakh um, equestrian warrior want an image of Bellerophon? What could he say to someone who is wandering you know, the Russian steppes and fighting various battles? And yet he must have, he meant something. Uh, also found in this tomb was a sword from China. Oh, it's such a cool tomb. <laughs> Uh, it's that same iconography, right? Like, so here's Rhodes, here's uh, Bellerophon with his spear getting ready to stab the Chimera, but very different style. Last but not least, I'm going to very quickly go through Ariadne, uh, uh, my one female heroine, and then I'll, I'll put in here. Uh, and so Ariadne, she is one like Bellerophon and Heracles that is immensely popular. She helps Theseus kill the Minotaur on Crete, you know, betrays her family. She's a princess of Crete. Um, Theseus abandons her. Uh, but we have, especially in Athenian pottery, tons and tons of images of Ariadne. Uh, she is usually shown as a companion of Theseus helping him defeat the Minotaur. Or after Theseus abandons her, Dionysus finds her and makes her into a god, his wife. And you'll see her along with Dionysus. In the Hellenistic period, she is very rarely shown with Theseus. They don't really care about Theseus and the Minotaur anymore. They only care about her as the 
cry of, of Dionysus, the, the becoming of the goddess. So she falls asleep, and Theseus you know, sneaks off, and Dionysus finds her while she's asleep. And we have a whole series of statues of her sleeping. Uh, the, one is a Roman copy of a Hellenistic original. There are tons of these. Uh, the original was probably made in Pergamon. We've lost it in the second century. And this becomes a symbol of immortality. After she goes to sleep, like death, and she wakes up and she's a god. And so this symbolism uh, becomes incredibly important, as does her connection with Dionysus. Dionysus, in his myth, goes into India, and he becomes a symbol of the conquest of the East. And so he's very popular. And Ariadne also becomes that symbol of the conquest of the East. So she's immortality, and she's the Eastern conquest. And uh, the Hellenistic period, they love this. So here's one from Rhodes. And this is what we see again and again. Uh, this is a repoussé relief that came from a larger pot. And this is her typical representation. She's either asleep or she's the young, beautiful girl with the young, beautiful Dionysus frolicking, being godly together. And pretty, symbol of luxury too. Uh, the next two I'll show you are definitely luxury goods. Um, one is from likely mainly Anatolia. It's in the Getty now with unclear provenance. Um, but it's this little bowl and here are Dionysus and Ariadne. And this is gold and silver. This would have been extraordinarily expensive. And there's also a whole series of these, um, of these bowls that have been found all over. Uh, these are two that are in the Asaba collection in Kuwait, uh, which is a pretty spectacular collection of Hellenistic metalware. And again, these are gold and silver. And these were said to have been found, again, on clear provenance. Uh, in northern Afghanistan. So here they are, young and beautiful, and these become these symbols of the East again. So we have these various gods and goddesses like Dionysus and Ariadne, but importantly heroes, Heracles and Bellerophon, who become something entirely new. They're the same, yet they're different. And this representation of them as being very, I think, great representations of the Hellenistic period, of the hybridization that happens after our conquests and imperialism of these large empires. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you all for listening, seeing some of my favorite artworks. Is there any questions? Or? Yeah, yeah, we'll take some questions. So Jordan. reasons. Um, but they become incorporated into the, into the canon of heroes or the group of heroes. Um, most of them tend to be local. So our city of um, Smyrna or whatever has our local hero. We don't have one where it's like somebody becomes incredibly important internationally for a hero. There's a bunch of gods that become incorporated into the pantheon. Um, so the second part, the first part of it, I don't know if I would count it as only an inversion, because I think part of it is, but I think part of it is also that these heroes start out as so much part of this cultural imperialism, that they are forced upon the local population of, um, we have conquered you, you are Greek, here are our heroes, and a way of trying to get people involved. And then I, I think over time, as people are trying to negotiate that, they adopt them as a way of dealing with that and by 
taking on what has been forced upon them and trans transitioning it into their own to claim something. So I mean, in some ways it's an inversion, but not entirely, if that answers it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the great talk. I, I was uh, sort of thinking about how one of the through lines in the heroes you chose is this connection positive or negatively to immortality and deification. Like Heracles is one of the very few heroes to become deified. You know, then the Ariadne at the you know conflict with Dionysus, and then Bellerophon is the opposite, right? It's this failed attempt. And I was wondering about the sort of valences of deification or failed deification in, in the context of the Hellenistic period, with ruler cults emerging sort of, sort of as like a new trend, and you know the contrast between Bellerophon and Heracles. It's an interesting point, especially because in so many of these, especially with Heracles, it comes back to that age-old question of, is he a hero or is he a god? And I think you could have the same one with Ariadne, too. Um, and I think there's part of that appeal um, of hero cult and the worshipping of heroes as a distinctly Greek practice translates in a lot of ways to areas where they are more clearly defined as gods. Of, okay, we're incorporating this into the pantheon. And so I think that connection with deification is an interesting one, of they become seen as gods. But Bellerophon, yeah, Bellerophon never gets to be a god, despite his birth status. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I don't have a definitive answer for you, but I think it's interesting. Yeah, Mac. Um, so in another, in another class, we talked about how the monsters that these heroes fight often represent the other, the uncivilized, and other groups of uses that you know, represent them bringing civilization. Um, I was just interested that these places that were once considered the other, the foreign to the Greeks, how they now promote these images of the chimera where Heracles fighting the lion. Was there ever a tension between that as they were at one point the other to the Greeks? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's one of our great things was, or great questions with studying Hellenistic art is we can identify, okay, this is a combination of Greek and not Greek, but trying to have the idea of what is not Greek and uncovering that and understanding that is hard. Um, and so how they're defining I am a Greek versus I am a barbarian, that definition changes pretty dramatically in the Hellenistic period of you have people, and this is another one of, can I identify the people who are making these and using these as well? They self-identified as Greek. And I don't know if they can. Um, I'm gonna go back to the beginning. I've kind of lost myself in answering your question there, but I, I, there is definitely tension, right? Because we have a sense of, in certain parts of the Hellenistic world, the Hellenization is much more thorough than it is in other parts. You know, so we could look at Anatolia in which Greek becomes lingua franca, the, the native languages die out, they're worshiping gods under Greek names, they have the importation of Greek cultural institutions and government, and we start to see people identifying as Greek. And this maintains itself into the Hellenist or into the Roman period. Yet aspects of the native pop culture don't go away. And they're especially noticeable in religion. But people are self-identifying as Greek there, and we can tell this pretty clearly. Uh, if we move to other parts of the Greek world, it's not as thorough. The native languages are still being spoken. We still have native gods being worshipped. I mean, I think homogeneity is a good example of that. Um, or in the Iranian plateau, we have two languages. And we have two languages and a lot of inscriptions. And so there is that tension of are we Greek? Are we Greco-Bactrian? Are we Greco-Persian? And you'll have a sense of, okay, well, we've conquered you, and either you're part of us or you're not. And so othering becomes more complicated, but it still happens. And I think it's frequently an othering of convenience because alliances and borders shift all the time in the Hellenistic period. I mean, it's like, hey, this year we're part of this empire, this year we're part of this. And most of these people are being ruled over by kings that they never see. Um, they rule from cities far away. And so their local cities are their governments, their, their um, identity and, and population. Yeah, Kishan. Um, I think it's a really interesting point of the, about the other, and, and I was wondering about the, you know, sort of the stylistic slippage that you can have as you move further and further east, mm -hmm. that your heroes, 
their, their style changes, their representation changes, and maybe they're becoming, you know, kind of more of that culture, mm -hmm. and, and in that way kind of dealing with that question of, you know, being born but one of us, mm -hmm. and... Um, yeah. Uh, Heracles shows up a lot in India, and I cut India because I was like, okay, I'm going too far, <laughs> this is way outside of my sphere of knowledge, but there are like these very kind of, um, very kind of um, different images of, of, of Heracles where he's kind of co-opted into Hinduism, for instance. Um, he shows up in a couple of uh, Buddhist images. And so yeah, he's kind of like, he's now ours, he's something different, or they call him different names. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious to hear more of your thoughts on the uh, like the image of Bellerophon that was found in mo modern Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. I just think it's interesting because like we're talking about all these ideas that maybe like part of incorporating these gods in, or these uh, heroes into your own kind of culture was a way of coping with the Hellenistic era. But when we're looking at like the steppe, which is you know it's like it's on the periphery of the Hellenistic kingdoms, but it isn't part of one. Yeah. So it's interesting that that iconography would be brought all the way up there. Uh, and I wonder with this, was it a, the person who owned it, did they get it because it was war booty, right? We have evidence that we have some of these tribes going into to Bactria and we have some battles. And so was this war booty that was taken back or was this something where it spoke to the person who, let's say, bought it rather than forcibly seizing it, which we don't know the circumstances, but you know, why does it speak to them? They're buried with it, so it must have had significance. And, you know, I think there's the fun of the hero stories. I mean, it's fun to talk about Bellerophon killing this monster. But that's what I'm still kind of diving into as I'm working with this, of why. It's just a really interesting case. Yeah. Yes? So I'm just thinking about another Hellenistic mm -hmm. hero you didn't touch on, and um, in literature it's uh, uh, Jason. Mm -hmm. And so um, the kind of the mirror myth that seems to have spread is Ariadne and Dionysus, whereas the Jason Medea, um, which is a similar myth, mm -hmm. um, Jason kind of uh, becomes this leader who's not a leader. Mm -hmm. So he's not um, valued for his prowess or um, you know, killing monsters. Um, so do you find Jason as a, a myth that is featured in art because he's definitely part of the epic, the Hellenistic yeah. epics of the Argonautic expeditions. When I started this, I was like, Jason's on my list, but I'm gonna find yeah. so much of Jason. I have found no Jason. That's why I wanted to tell you, well, this is where it's interesting yeah. because you're dealing with individual heroes, mm -hmm. whereas Jason is not an individual, he is part of a crew. Mm -hmm. And so it's really focusing on how many people you need so that you can achieve this conquest. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems to me that um, Heracles is the Embelerophon. Um, they are remnants of an earlier period where the individual could be doing this conquest. So it's more about collaboration and it's more about pers personification. So Heracles doesn't become the hero Heracles, but is the personification of the conquest. Yeah. Um, so it's the it, they change a lot in, in their semantics. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I found interesting because the hybridization and secret syncretism and all of that you see, but it's interesting the choice. Mm -hmm. So men like Theseus fall off, Bellerophon falls off, but Medea and Ariadne are deified in different ways and the East becomes more um, central as, as more dominant uh, with their own images mm -hmm. in its integration. So that, that's what I see. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, with Jason, it's like, I, I, yeah, I started on this. I was like, okay, Argonautica, they're going to, he travels all over. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there are no images yeah. of Jason. He's yeah. just, and I think part of it is you can argue that the Argonautica sets up Jason as not a hero, yeah. right? And so, yeah. but why don't they like, you know, yeah. the Golden Fleece or the dragon? Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work. And I think that idea of the teamwork is an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, the lack of, Jason could kind of play into the idea that the heroes are almost filling the role of kingship in Greece, which doesn't have a traditional king. Because yeah. if you look elsewhere at all great stories of like heroes, they usually are kings, like Gilgamesh, 
and even way later with like um, King Arthur, like they're all kings as well as heroes. And so the individual heroes probably perform better because they fill that role of kingship rather than group heroes. And it's definitely Heracles becomes so closely associated with kingship. Um, Bellerophon less. Dionysus and Ariadne. Dionysus a little bit with kingship, but Ariadne not much. But it's definitely Heracles becomes that symbol of legitimacy for kingship. Yeah, Carolyn. It might also come from like the tradition of lions, hunting lions, they could uh, harm the gods, have clubs, uh, with which they, they strike their enemies, they have beards, etc. So I think it's a very easy translation into yeah. the original background of what does it what does a king do? And the king is a hero, as is <coughs> for Tannen in the in the yeah. So there's a kind of like background for mm -hmm. the emergence this motif of this like yeah yeah it's a, it's a good point of that idea of the monster killer the lion killer as the near eastern king um i always think about the heracles of Veniston because it's right near that darius right. really yeah right. um it's uh, associated with the previous kings and yeah history and, and that kind of establishing that local satrap putting himself in that history with heracles Yes. Uh, this is a bit out of uh, scope, like connecting with India, but uh, have you, uh, in your uh, research, come across any uh, connections to Heracles or uh, other figures of Greek mythology in China? Because I know that the Chinese Empire, uh, or like mm -hmm. one of the, I think it was the Han Dynasty, took over uh, Greek Greco Bactria for a while in a previous war. So I haven't looked at China. I know there are. A few scholars who have. There's an article that I was reading that had a connection. Let's look at Heracles in China. But I kind of cut off the, like, I'm, it's outside of my world. So yes, I don't have an answer for you. But I think he might show up there, but I don't know. Yeah? So just a, another quick question. I was wondering your thoughts on, like, so we talked about, like, how, like, the, the theme of, like, the Orient and, like, Easternness with Dionysus and Ariadne. Did that take on new meaning once that, like, those thoughts were actually brought into Asia? Oh, you mean like, okay, this is the, like, once they are shown in what was the tradition Yeah, like, because like, for the Greeks, they, mm -hmm. they were thought of that way, but it wasn't like Dionysus had actually been there. Yeah, I think it just, it kind of grows in popularity um, because it's like, oh, look, Dionysus, uh, this is our part of the world and we are, we are part of the Greek world is because this is a, Traditional conquest or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes on kind of a, a new meaning because it isn't the foreign mm -hmm. exotic area. It is part of their interconnected world, um, and that is where Dionysus does get associated with the kingship because it's like, okay, well, Dionysus went into India, and so we the kings, um, even though they never really had much of of India under Greek rulership, they they do take on that. Well, I think we can continue this discussion over drinks. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. let us thank Amanda Herring for.